what's up guys i hope you're doing well james here from jamesdforsight.com and i wanted to elaborate a little bit about kind of the relationship between paul warburg and senator aldrich um from warburg's point of view obviously um this is continuing on with uh using his book uh the federal reserve system its origin and growth 1930 kind of as a reference right so pretty much talking about kind of the beginnings of the re evolution of the central reserve plan right and so when this when this whole idea of a kind of central bank and central reserve system kind of started to become a thing really and what were their kind of opinions on it and so this really kind of starts with the aldrich freeland act and kind of where the the most kind of prominent uh provision of that bill was the creation of the National Monetary Co Commission, or just the Monetary Commission, sorry. And then basically the whole purpose of this was to basically j just do like academic research in a way and to kind of compile different opinions on um, banking methods, um, looking at the way they change um, from different countries and things like that. So like the Monetary Commission went to Europe a few times talk to kind of old world bankers um as they're sometimes called to uh see how they run things see how they're different maybe how they can improve things like that right really kind of and then also draft different reports and papers and, and stuff like create a body of research for this for this kind of topic right and so one of the things i've noticed um, before, at least in the very beginning, and this changed obviously, with um, specifically with respect to the relationship between Warburg and Senator Aldrich, was it eventually kind of turned into a, I'd say kind of t kind of tight academic relationship. At least it seems to be, um, but it didn't start out like that because um, before the passage of the acts and the series and things like that um this um what i'm talking about is like the federal reserve act um and before all the research for the national reserve association thing like things like that right um aldrich was known to be on the side of having a bond backed currency and he was kind of basically like the head honcho or whatever you want to call it and for lack of a better term because at this time in the mid, um, that first decade of the 1900s, like 1905 to 1907 ish or so, around when all of this was starting, right, up until like 1910, really, Senator Aldrich was kind of pretty much the leader of all of this um, in terms of Congress, right? Because even then, according to this at least, um, he held a position of unparalleled power in the Republican Party um, as the Republican Party leader in the Senate, um, which had been almost uninterruptedly under Republican control for over a generation, right? And talking about the Senate, right? And so basically, since Aldrich had this alternate point of view with respect to Warburg, he didn't think... Warburg didn't think he could basically convert him over to the whole Central Reserve plan, right? And so to say explicitly in Warburg's own own words, he had developed a feeling of deep resentment towards him because whenever the question of banking reform was raised, one was told that so long as Aldrich was in power, there was no there was no hope whatever of weaning the country off the system of a bond secured currency to which he had so strongly committed his party right and so we talked a little bit about that i guess a little bit more in depth in one of the previous videos between um kind of the first aldrich plan the 1908 version not the one not to be confused with the one in 1912 kind of talking about the national reserve association um but the 1908 version I don't, I don't even really want to say version, but they're, sep they're completely separate bills just by the same guy, right? Or at least sponsored by the same guy. And basically to where it was a bond-secured currency versus the Fowler plan, which was more of a asset-backed currency, right? And so keeping that in mind. And so basically Warburg kind of slowly tried to 
provide his argument for his uh, his kind of system in a way, right? And so, and he did this through a series of papers, um, discussions, talking and giving advice to different committees, um, not even even just political committees, but like um, merchant committees, um, merchant associations, things like that, which we'll get into as we go through um, the book and such. So he also urged um, Senator Aldrich to consider the possibility of organizing a central clearinghouse, which would issue a uniform circulation instead of permitting every individual bank to issue its own notes. And so we also talked a little bit about this kind of centralizing the note issue itself um, so that basically the monetary system would be more centralized and kind of controllable in a way. Um, rather than having every single commercial bank being able to issue their own currency or even just um, individual states in a way, right? So like where exactly is that kind of sovereignty drawn, so to speak, right? And so one of the things that kind of, that I noticed was Aldrich's kind of opinion of all this kind of changed rather early in terms of the whole grand scheme of things of the pro um the process of monetary reform i guess we'll say and so basically quoting aldrich now directly he said there is one advocated by many thoughtful students of economic history and teachings who are led by the experience and practice of their commercial nations to favor some plan for a central bank of issue which would be in which would be in the in effect a central clearinghouse with very limited banking functions under government control. Personally, I believe, I being Senator Aldrich, um, that in time this this country is likely to adopt such a system. But I agree with other members of the committee that its adoption at this time or in the near future is out of the question. So he was some, kind of of the same opinion as Warburg and other kind of prominent monetary figures at the time, right? Basically, with general American sentiment, a central bank was not going to be a thing anytime soon at this point, right? Or at least that's what it was thought to be. And so it really had to be until after the panic of 1907 and kind of all of that stuff <laughs> before sentiment could really change to the point that it would be allowed, in, uh, so to speak. And even then, it was kind of sold to the public as not a central bank, right? It was more of kind of, that's why it's the Federal Reserve System, and it has the de decentralized 12 reserve banks, and then the FOMC is a different part, um, which actually wasn't even a thing in the original part. The original bill is just the Board of Governors. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but you get the point, right? They had to kind of finagle their way in there so to speak so after the panic in 1907 a great many commercial bodies had organized special committees for the purpose of studying the banking problem and he gives the example of the merchants association in new york um and specifically the committee on their their committee on currency right this is one of those committees that warburg really gave a lot of advice to um and pretty much he's this is when he really started to get into um, talking to economists to major professors major academic kind of elite in a way at the time to really kind of push his views forward and make them more known and to kind of sway sentiment um, maybe not even necessarily public sentiment but also just like the, the sentiment of the academic elite the people who are actually going to sign the bills do the research that sort of thing um where society kind of pushes the, that responsibility onto them and kind of lets them i don't want to say indoctrinated but kind of in a way to get them to his side right basically provide an argument and win them over right so there's that, um, and this includes people like Mr. Irving T. Bush, uh, Johnson French, Professor Joseph French Johnson, if I could read. <laughs> um, oh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, they were both on the committee, and then quite a few other ones. There's a pretty extensive list. 
but basically he would go down there and he would spend like nights and pretty much and whole evenings and afternoon like a lot of time basically going over it and he even explicitly calls it um saying that he was struggling to win them over to the gospel of all of, I can't talk this morning to win them over to the gospel of centralized reserves and elastic note issue and learning in turn from them in the in what respects his ideas could be modified right really trying to kind of tone his argument right which is something especially if you're going to be reforming an entire monetary system that eventually I mean he wouldn't have known at the time which develops into a more globalized monetary system to where there's not really individual countries in terms of monetary systems anymore it's kind of all connected in a way to where it's really just one global monetary system um or at least there's a rather sound argument for that and we'll leave it there for now um but one of these papers that he actually wrote and he get and he actually gave a presentation it seems in front of the american economic association which was titled the central bank system and the United States, and let's see if I can get the actual date. No, I don't see it. But anyways, um, basically this is one of those that addresses that he gave to where he started to propose his, the base views that eventually got kind of drafted into um, not only the Aldrich plan, but also the actual Federal Reserve Act itself right and so this includes like the uh, conversion principles or privileges sorry um for the government bonds um this is one thing that it stated a few times in the gov in the federal reserve act basically where the two percent government bonds with circulation privilege would be exchanged for three percent without the privilege um also basically having uh the actual earnings of the what would become the Federal Reserve banks, the regional banks themselves. Basically, you have that fixed dividend that goes to the stockholders of the Federal Reserve banks, um, and then all excess goes to the Treasury. Um, this was really kind of initially placed in this article or paper, whatever you want to call it. Um, again, a central, a central bank system in the United States um, is the title of it. And basically, yeah, ba all of the excess over that dividend would go to the treasury, um, obviously barring expenses and things like that. Um, and then also, it, the whole purpose for this was at the time was retiring the greenbacks from the Civil War still, or um, at least improving the gold backing of those greenbacks, right? And that was really the whole purpose of giving it to the government, right? And so, kind of to finish off with a much a, a longer quote we'll say specifically for um why he was kind of changing the he wasn't trying to sell it as a central bank so so to speak it was really trying to say it's a central kind of clearing house right and he says that he avoided calling the institution of the future a central bank. That's what he calls it, is institu institution of the future. Uh, because as proposed here, it is not a central bank. If instead of the Independent Currency Association, this central issue department were endowed with active branch offices dependent upon the head, the head office, such a name would be correct. No doubt a central bank with active branches would be the most efficient so far as concerns the controlling of the country's gold, its money rates, and its financial safety. But with our present political and financial conditions, it would probably be impossible and in many respects unsafe to vest such powers and duties in one body, right? And so this is really... And throughout the entire, not even just this book, but other articles um, and other primary sources, letters that you can see um, between Warburg and some other prominent figures at the time, like Colonel House, uh, President Woodrow Wilson, um, some of the other ec major economists and professors that he was talking to doing this research and things like that. Um, 
really the main reason why they didn't want to sell it as a uh, or I guess market it as a central bank is because of the political and financial conditions at the time to use his own words um, and really kind of the control aspect because at this time people were still very anti-centralization especially in terms of money right in the monetary system and so that's you really have to kind of look at that as a backdrop and put everything against it because it really is applicable to how all of this works and I've made what much more in depth on that in a separate video um, which I already forgot the title of so anyways yes I'm gonna leave that one here so I hope you guys have a good night, and I will see you on the next one.